Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is uh, uh, Rahman Dus Mohammadi. I'm a system research professor uh, here at Rice ECE. Uh, welcome to today's distinguished uh, ECE seminar. Uh, it is actually a great pleasure today to have uh, Dr. Ranveer Chandra from Microsoft Research. Um, Dr. Chandra needs no introduction to most people at Rice, but nevertheless, uh, he is the CTO of uh, AgriFood currently, the Managing Director of Research for Industry and the Networking Research Lead at MSR. Uh, his research not only has shipped into a large body of Microsoft products, but also has had significant societal and policy impacts. Uh, one of his most recent projects, which I believe we'll be here about today is uh, FarmBeats. Uh, that started in 2015 uh, and later shipped as a Microsoft product in 2019. Uh, he is one of the pioneers of uh, white space networking, a technology that enabled using a vacant TV spectrum for wireless communication, which itself later translated into a standard communication technology. He was listed uh, in 35 under 35 MIT Technology Review in 2010. He has published more than 100 uh, papers, holds more than 100 patents, US patents. Uh, he is also a fellow of, a, uh, fellow of IEEE and uh, also has won many awards, including best paper awards at various ACM and Usenix conferences. Uh, he received his bachelor's from IoT Karakpur in, in India and PhD from Cornell. So uh, before starting uh, the talk, uh, I would like to give a few ho uh, housekeeping rules to our audience. Please uh, leave your questions at the Q&A box uh, below. And at the end of the talk, I will read them back to uh, Dr. Chandra and hopefully we can have a discussion there. So uh, I would like to welcome again, uh, Ranveer. Uh, welcome to Rice Virtually and the floor is yours. Thank you, Rahman, and thank you everyone for joining. And yeah, I would have loved to be there in person, but I think this is the next best alternative. But as I was telling Edward, uh, I'll come there for the drinks and beer, the, the dinner that you, that you provide to the visitors. So today I'll talk about some of the work that I've been doing for about the last six years on farm beats, on data-driven agriculture. So to start with, uh, as, uh, as Rahman mentioned, my background is not in agriculture. I'm a PhD in computer science. However, growing up, I spent a lot of time in my grandparents' farm in India. As it happens, um, there were some people from India on the, on the call. As you know, by growing up, you do spend a lot of time uh, in your, with, spending time with your grandparents. And in my case, my grandparents used to live in Bihar, in North Bihar. Um, and I used to, getting there was quite an expedition. I used to uh, take a train, take a, take a bus, and then get on a horse, uh, uh, a horse cart and then get to their place. It used to be like 24 hours to get there from my hometown. I used to live in the city. But three to four months every year, I would be spending with my grandparents. Back then, I did not like anything to do with agriculture. That is, I did not like the, the time I spent there. These villages, they did not have any electricity. They did not have uh, any, any toilets. And I really didn't look forward to spending my, my vacations in those farms. But that said, it did expose me to large amounts of poverty that exists in India. A lot of very primitive forms of agriculture that, that farmers there would practice. And through my time at Microsoft, through most of the research, I've been trying to do projects that can impact them. And this was one of those projects. But in fact, the goal of this project was much more. That is, as many of you know, the world has a food problem. The world's food production needs to increase by 70% compared to 2010 levels to feed the growing population of the world. And it's not just about growing more food. You need to grow good food, nutritious food to feed the planet. And the challenge is you need to grow more nutritious food, even though the amount of arable land is not increasing, the, the water levels are receding, the soil's not getting, getting any richer. So then the question is, how can you grow more nutritious food without harming the planet in a sustainable way. One of the most promising, uh, promising approaches to achieve this, this uh, the solution is that of data-driven agriculture. 
one of the things you could do with data-driven agriculture is, for example, you could map every farm in the world with data. For example, what is the soil moisture level, six inches below the soil? What's the soil nutrient level? What's the soil temperature level? If you could map farms like this, it would enable techniques like precision agriculture. You could then apply water only where it is needed. You could apply pesticides only where it is needed. You could plant seeds closer or farther apart based on what your farm looks like. In fact, precision agriculture has been shown to improve yields. You could grow, grow your plants better. It has been shown to reduce cost because you use less water, less pesticide, less nutrients. And it's also better for the environment. You're not, you're not wasting water. You're not wasting pesticide. In fact, the state of the art is many growers would just go and uniformly spray, uniformly spray inputs in the farm, like uniformly spray water, uniformly spray fertilizer. With precision agriculture, you can be much more efficient. And in fact, you could do much more. If you look at the entire food supply chain, all the way from input companies to a farm, which I just talked about, to food processing centers, distribution centers, every entity in this food supply chain would benefit with data and data-driven insights. They could then improve their efficiencies. But in fact, if you could start sharing data across the entire supply chain, this could then unlock even greater efficiencies, lead to new business models that didn't exist until now. For example, you could start enabling traceability scenarios. You could see for, for food safety, you could see where did that particular food arise from. If you could share data from the farm through the supply chain all the way to the retailer, in some cases, the consumer. It could also enable techniques like precision agriculture, which I talked about. If some of these digital advisors could know what's happening in the farm, what's, what input seeds are you using, what are the chemical types coming from different companies, you could then start providing precision agriculture solutions. In fact, all the latest discussions happening around sustainability, growers can be reimbursed if they could start sharing their data, talking about how they grew the crop, whether they used any of the regenerative agriculture practices. The thing is, even though the benefits of data-driven agriculture are very well known, these techniques still hasn't taken off. In fact, and one of the biggest reasons these techniques haven't taken off is because of the cost of existing digital agriculture solutions. In fact, I was uh, when, I, when I started this project, I went to UC Davis, uh, University of California Davis, which is one of the good uh, agriculture schools. There was an expo going on and the lead, and the least expensive sensor package, I'm talking about the lowest cost one, were five sensors for $8,000 and a recurring cost. For most growers, what is the ROI? What is the return of investment of putting five sensors in the farm? So that was when we started this project, the Palm Beach project, our goal was, can we significantly bring down the cost of these digital solutions, say by two orders of magnitude, from 8,000 to, yeah, to 80? And I'll talk about a few ways in which we believe we can get there. So one of the challenges, which I think will appeal to many of you, is that of connectivity in the farm. That is, the problem is the following. The farmer's, far, the farmer's house or office had good, has good connectivity to the cloud, but the actual farm is a few miles away. So then the question, and sometimes, you know, when they plant the seeds, you might have connectivity. By the time the plants grow, the connectivity is gone. So then the question is, how will you transmit data from the middle of the farm to the farmer's house, which could be a few miles away? To address this question, at Microsoft, of course, we're using many techniques to address this. We are using things like private 5G, space communication. But one of the other ones which we are using is a technology that I personally have been working on since 2005, which Rice University has contributed a lot towards this as well. We worked on joint projects, is that of TV white spaces. What the TV white spaces enables is, in one of the scenarios is, imagine if you have a Wi-Fi router that you could access miles away. That would be cool, right? If you could access your, right now, as soon as you exit your house, your Wi-Fi disappears. One of the techniques we had built back in the day was a way you could take your Wi-Fi signal and put them in empty TV channels. This is TV you watch using antennas over the air, and over the air TV. You know, when you browse through TV on certain channels, you get a transmission. The other channels, you get white noise. With this technology, you could put Wi-Fi signals in empty TV channels in a way that doesn't interfere with your TV reception in an, in an adjacent channel. So you could be watching channel seven at home. On channel eight, we could be sending Wi-Fi signals. 
And the reason this is so cool is that compared to Wi-Fi at the same power levels, in UHF, UHF TV channels, your signals go more than four times farther. In VHF, they go more than 12 times farther, and that's in free space. Once you put in trees, crops, canopies, your signals just keep growing through. So back in the day, the FCC chairman had come to see the demo we had put together on Microsoft campus. This was all made legal in the US as well. Since then, we've gone out, deployed this in high schools, hospitals, dispensaries, in various parts of the world, connecting them to the internet as a low cost alternative to provide connectivity. The interesting thing about agriculture is that TV towers are in cities. You have TV towers, say, in Seattle, in Chicago, in Houston. The farms are away from the cities. If you turn on a TV in the middle of a farm, most of these channels are just white noise. In fact, I was giving this talk at the National Corn Growers Association meeting, and I was saying that even if 20 TV channels are available, and then there was this lady farmer from Kansas, she raised her hand and she said, in, in, in our house, we only get two TV channels. And that's the case in most parts of rural America. So with this, with, with, with the TV white spaces, we believe just like Wi-Fi connects your house, this is one technology using which you can connect your entire farm. And we've been doing this in various spots, various farms where you just put this antenna and miles around it gets connected, streaming data, not just from sensors, from drones, tractors, because each channel in the US is six megahertz wide. Even if you have 20 TV channels, you have 20 times six, 120 megahertz of spectrum, which you can use to send large amounts of data. Like even if you use uh, like one antenna, you could be talking of close to half a gigabit per second. If you use some of the technologies that have been developed at RISE, like by Skylark, you're talking of even more capacities if you start using all the available capacity that's available in the middle of a farm. One of the other things we've done here is we're using the same spectrum to provide rural broadband as well, not just in the middle of a farm, but also to provide rural connectivity. And I'll talk a little bit about that initiative later. So with that, we are able to address, at least partially address, the, the, the cost of connectivity in the middle of a farm. The second challenge, and I talked a little bit about this, was how do you, we want to build maps like this. For any farm, we want to be able to say, this is what is the soil moisture level six inches below the soil. This is what is the soil nutrient level, NPK, nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus. This is what it is throughout the farm. The question is, if you have to build an accurate map like this, you would need lots and lots of sensors. Because as uh, some of you might know, the soil moisture levels vary with every 10 meters, like every row to row, your soil moisture might vary. So to get an accurate map, you would need a sensor, say every 10 meters. But putting a sensor every 10 meters is expensive to deploy, to manage. It will come in the way of the farmer as the farmer does the day-to-day -day job. So the key question we asked then was, can we build a map like this using very few sensors? To address that problem, the state of the art, by the way, is because sensors are expensive, people would put very few sensors and then use either linear interpolation or Craig's method to predict everything in between. That if one point is X, the other point is Y, everything in between would probably be between X and Y. But that is shown to be very inaccurate. Instead, what we came up with was another technique using multimodal AI. A key idea was to use aerial imagery from drones. So you could fly a drone over a farm. You could then construct the ortho mosaic that you're seeing over here, like a panoramic view of the farm. Of course, drones, you can't use drones everywhere, especially if you're talking about the emerging markets. Like I talked about my motivation of getting all of these technologies being used in India in a small farm in Bihar. That's not happening with drones. So we need an alternative technology. One of the things we came up with was to use helium filled balloons. So the question was, for a farm, how do you construct an aerial image at low cost? So what we decided to do was use helium-filled balloons, which are about four feet in diameter. These are tethered to the ground. They go up about 150, 200 feet. And what we did was on the weatherproof mount, we allow a farmer to put their smartphone with a battery pack attached to it. And this thing can stay up from four to seven days taking images of the farm. In fact, someone could just walk around with the balloon because labor is inexpensive in these emerging markets. And then we use computer vision techniques to create these aerial images of the farm. In fact, uh, Bill Gates had come to the farm close to Microsoft campus where we've done a deployment. And you could see if you read his Gates Notes article, you'll see him walking around with that balloon. It's not, so drones and balloons are great, but we are not going to scale with that in the near term. We won't get images from all the farms. So for other farms, what we use is satellite imagery. And, use, and these are not just 
RGB bands, but also looking at multispectral and hyperspectral bands as well. Then what we do is we use, in some of these places in the farm, you would have sensors or soil samples. We then use uh, machine learning to interpolate the data from a few sensors in all other parts of the farm. And the way we do this is wherever you have sensors, at that location, we also look at the imagery, that's RGB and multispectral hyperspectral, whatever data we have. We use that to train the machine learning model for that particular ground truth data for all the sensors. And then we then use this model to predict these values in other parts of the farm where you don't have sensors. And we've done this for soil temperature, soil pH, and soil moisture. And in the research paper we've written on this, we've shown that using aerial imagery can give you three times more accurate data, these maps, than existing schemes that do not use aerial imagery. One of the challenges though, right, if you're building this kind of map, is I talked about satellite imagery. A key challenge of satellite imagery is that more than uh, at, at in any instant in time, more than 77% of the planet is covered with clouds. If it's covered with clouds, you don't really see what's happening below the clouds. One of the techniques that one of my interns from MIT built is a way to see through the clouds in satellite imagery using a technique called space art. What you're seeing here is on the left is what you get right now with existing imagery. On the right, on a daily basis, we are able to predict what's happening below the clouds with over 95% accuracy in three of the four seasons uh, in a year. For snow, we are still trying to address that, how to get it close to 95%. The way we address this problem is we use data from another satellite that has SAR in it, synthetic aperture radar. As you know, radar signals, they go through clouds and they reflect differently from different surfaces. For example, if the soil is moist or the soil is dry, the reflections would be different. We use that data, the SAR data, to then predict what, and uh, a new GAN technique we developed to predict what's happening below the clouds in satellite imagery. We did this for farms. We've also done this for like the port of Seattle where you could see ships coming and going for construction sites, for forest fires. We're able to predict all of that below the clouds using this technology called SpaceArt. So the third challenge we had, we ran into was from the farm, we talked about how using the TV white spaces, you could get large amounts of data to the farmer's house, but the connectivity from the farmer's house to the cloud is weak. Most farmers, they pay for broadband, but all they get is one to three megabits per second of connection. And in, in, there is a farm in upstate New York where we have a deployment where every time there is a snowstorm, there's a high likelihood that the internet connection goes off. So then the question is, if you're capturing large amounts of data from a farm and you don't have good connectivity to the cloud, how will you bring benefits of all of this data to the grower? Just to put this in perspective, every time we fly a drone, we are collecting several gigabytes of data. And sending all of the gigabytes of data to the cloud over a one to three megabit per second connection will take forever. So to address this problem, we our key thesis was that, a key idea was that most farmers have PCs. If they don't have a PC, we would ship them a PC form factor device. This would run Azure IoT Edge. This would be a computer sitting in the farmer's house or office. And then this would get data from the middle of the farm and perform a lot of compute sitting in the farmer's house or office. All the computer vision, the AI machine learning would happen in the farmer's house or office. Just double clicking on what's inside this Azure IoT Edge, everything you're seeing in this big gray box is running in the farm in that particular machine. We are getting data from sensors. We are getting data from drones. We are doing computer vision to generate the 3D point cloud and the panoramas, the auto mosaics. We combine them with sensors to create these heat maps, which are, uh, we've done this, as I said, for soil moisture, soil temperature, pH, and others. This would then go into the last column here where you're seeing all of these agricultural applications. These are things that Microsoft wouldn't build. This would be built by partners, people who are experts for different agricultural applications. All of this data is then sent lazily to the cloud. We also ingest data from cameras. We'll be doing deep learning at the edge. I'll talk about one of those scenarios. And then we have offline storage. We won't send all of the data to the cloud. Some data would be lazily sent, like we would send the important parts of an image to the cloud immediately, while the rest of it could be shipped to the cloud using just uh, on-ground shipping. We also have a web server so that in case this edge goes offline, you're able to still continue serving content using this web server. And all of this data goes to the cloud where you then start doing additional analytics, merging with satellite data, merging with weather data, and so on. So 
So this was something in research where there was more we did, but we deployed this in multiple farms when it was still in research, in farms varying anywhere from half an acre to up to 9,000 acres. And I'll talk about a few of the use cases of how growers have been using this technology. This is a farm in, in Eastern Washington. One of the things we do is, so when we give a sensor, of, uh, when you give a farmer a sensor, we not only tell what the values are right now from that sensor, but we also predict what these values would be up to five days in advance. So on the right, you're seeing this graph, where if you look at the red bar, the error for soil moisture and soil temperature, even up to five days in advance, is less than, less than 8%. And the way we build this is we, we take the, because you know, weather is one of the most important parameters for agriculture. Farmers always want to know what's happening in the middle of the farm. Yet the weather predictions that we get these days is what's happening at the weather station, not really what's happening in the farm. What we did was when you put a sensor in the farm, we then use data from 50 weather stations across Washington state. At these are, this is data from the last seven years at 15 minute intervals. We use that data to train a machine learning model. And then when you put a sensor in the farm, we then start making very hyper-local predictions based on where your sensor is. We take some time to train up, but after that, we start improving the model and start making very hyper-local predictions of what's happening in the farm, not necessarily what's happening in the weather station. On the bottom left of this slide, you're seeing a testimonial by one of the farmers that we work with. This is a farmer in Eastern Washington. He was going to, he, he farms, uh, 9,000 acres spread across 45 miles. And he, he plants wheat. He's a fifth generation wheat farmer. And he was going to spray chemicals in some part of the farm, uh, spray herbicide, which is really heavily infested with, with weeds. The forecast was that the temperature was going to be 42 degrees. We predicted that it was going to be 30. It was actually 31 degrees. Good he didn't go and spray because it would have otherwise spoiled his crop. The other way he uses the same, uh, uh, the, this microclimate prediction is to look at wind. When he takes out his tractor, because he has a big farm spread across 45 miles, he looks at what is the wind prediction in different parts of, its, of his farm. So that when he takes his tractor out, his tractor is most effective. The spraying is going to be more effective if the winds are not that high. The other use case I like talking about is this one, which is a four kilometer stretch in upstate New York. The farmer wanted to know how his cows are doing once they are out in pasture. So we flew the drone, transmitted the data over the white spaces to an edge device. And within 30 minutes, we are able to flag things like the grass is growing back well from left to right. This is a water puddle that needs to be fixed before the next planting season. The cows are pooping well, which was also important information for the farmer. This is deep learning on cow poop. <laughs> this is where the cows are. This is a stray cow that needs to be herded in. All of this within 30 minutes of flying the drone. This is a farm close to Microsoft campus. This is the place where we had done a deployment and we hosted multiple people, multiple um, uh, ag executives. Bill Gates spent uh, quite a bit of time there blogging when he created that video of, on Farm Beats, which he blogged about. We show the farmer these beautiful pictures. This is, this is a smallholder farmer who's, who sells produce to restaurants, to schools when they were open. And in his, of course, his operations have been kind of disrupted right now. But to this farmer, we show these beautiful pictures. We overlay this with data. For example, here the, in the bottom left part, we were able to flag that those parts of the farm are moist. And uh, even though we did not have a sensor over there. This is after the farmer had applied lime. We were able to flag that the dark parts of the farm are still acidic. The farmer needs to reapply lime before planting the seeds. This is a, the deep learning study I was talking about with cameras. So there's a, this is in upstate New York. We had put cameras and we are streaming and we are finding out which cows are sick, whether the cows are moving well and flagging that information to the grower. That is like a, you can think of it like a baby monitor for cows. The interesting thing about that cow scenario is that it's very hard to imagine without edge compute, without low cost connectivity, it's very hard for a farmer to enable those scenarios, even though they are very high value. So this was all in research. And then in 2018, I moved over to the, to the product side to ship this as a product. We, uh, we announced Azure Farm Beats as a product in 2019. And our, our go-to market is the following. It's a cloud-based offering. 
what we've done is, you know, right now there are many ag tech solutions. Some of them, they'll take a subset of these inputs, what you're seeing at the bottom, they build their own custom pipelines, trying to bring it to the cloud. They then try to write their own AI and build solutions for, for growers. Their companies are big and small uh, ag tech companies building these solutions. What we realized was that a large part of it is something that we could build better to, bu to build this data platform. And our go-to market is very partner-led. What we are building in FarmBeats is a cloud-based offering. We work with partners, sensor partners, tractor partners, weather partners, and we create this API. We give them our technologies, like the TV white space radios that we built around IoT. We've done stuff there. We give that technology, the edge technologies to the partners, and we through the APIs, we ingest that data to the cloud. Once we ingest that data, we then create a way to an API. Basically, we provide a way for, for ag tech companies to write their AI solutions on top of all of this data, like for example, the sensor fusion algorithm I talked about. And then these partners would take the solutions to the growers. So to a grower, they might be using a solution from a partner, but behind the scenes, they might be using FarmBeats. And of course, we, we over the last year and a half, we worked with multiple partners, sensor partners, drone partners, weather companies, robotic companies, and we're working on bringing their data to FarmBeats. We've also announced partnerships with multiple companies. Uh, we announced a partnership with Lando Lakes, for example. Lando Lakes, as you know, is one of the biggest farmer-owned cooperatives in the US. And Lando Lakes announced that it's moving all of its digital agriculture solutions on top of FarmBeats. So we are working on building the data platform, bringing the latest in technology with edge compute, with artificial intelligence, all of that to, uh, uh, we're bringing all of that to the cloud, to agriculture, on top of which the experts from say Lando Lakes or PepsiCo or USDA, they would bring their ag tech knowledge to build the solutions to that can then be taken to the farmers. And we are continuing to build on this, on this FarmBeats platform as a product. In addition to that, we are not just doing research and products, we are taking everything a step further through some of the work on taking this technology all the way to society. And I'll talk about a few of those. As part of our rural broadband initiative, airband initiative, in uh, 2017, we announced that we, Microsoft made a pledge to connect 3 million rural Americans to broadband by 2022. And we are well on the path to that. The number you're seeing here is from 2019, but now we are way on path to exceed where we were, what, what we were aiming for. And one of the key enabling technologies to, to get there is TV white spaces. And, but we are also part, we're looking at other technologies as well, such as uh, CBRS, private 5G, space communications. And through the Airband program, we are creating partnerships. Skylark, for example, is one of our partners, uh, Airband partners, and we are partnering with them, giving them, uh, giving them access to resources, creating additional partnerships to help them expand their coverage in, and bring broadband to rural America. The interesting thing here, by the way, is through this initiative, we are mostly talking about connecting people in rural America, more than 25 million households which do not have broadband connectivity. The harder problem here, I think, is how do you connect farmlands. That is, when we talk about the future of data-driven agriculture, we need connectivity, not just in the farmer's house, but in the middle of the farm. There was a recent statistic that said that only 25% of US farmland have internet connectivity. And then how do you get more internet access, more broadband access in the middle of the farm? That's a hard problem. And that's something which we are continuing to investigate, ways in which we can, we can bridge that. The other thing we are doing is we are working a lot on sustainability. Uh, last year in January, we made a big commitment from Microsoft. We announced that Microsoft was going to be carbon negative by 2030. What that means is that by 2030, we'd be putting more carbon back in soil than the amount of carbon that we generate. If you if you think at carbon at a very high level, carbon below the below the ground is good. Carbon carbon uh, above the ground is bad, right? And what we want to do is come up with ways to put more and more carbon back in the soil. So as part of our commitment, we not just said that we're going to be carbon negative by 2030, we made an even bolder commitment. We said that by 2050, we are going to be removing all the emissions that we've ever generated since the time Microsoft was founded. 
And towards that, it's not just words. Our CFO put in a billion dollars towards the Climate Innovation Fund. So if you think of it, we, we've come up with a plan of, okay, how are we going to get there? If you look at this graph with the blue, blue line, part of it is going to come by 2030, how will we get to carbon negative? Part of it will come through by, by reducing our own emissions. So by making our data centers more efficient, by making a supply chain, uh, reducing the emissions of our supply chain, we'll be able to get to part of it, but that's not going to be enough. We need to be purchasing carbon credits. We need to be investing in new ways of putting carbon back in soil. Agriculture is one of the ways in which you could put carbon back in soil. As you know, through photosynthesis, these plants, they capture carbon from the air, right? And they emit oxygen and they can, this, this carbon can be stored in the soil, in roots, in the biomass. And a lot of recent work has gone into showing how can agriculture put more carbon in soil by techniques known as regenerative agriculture. That is, if farmers use practices such as no-till or reduced till, they do good nutrient management, they plant cover crops, they could really be reducing their, they could be putting more carbon back in soil. So, uh, but the challenge here, the key challenge is how do you accurately quantify the amount of carbon in soil in an economical way? And there we are investing quite a bit of research, even in my group and other teams at Microsoft, and we partner closely with academia to help address this problem. One of the other things we are doing for societal impact, this is around skilling on bridging the rural skill, skill gap. Uh, so what Microsoft has done is uh, we, our Microsoft Philanthropies team, we've partnered with the 4-H and the FFA. We've also created a Palm Beach student kit. This is a kit, which is like an IOP kit along with, uh, along with the curriculum. And these kits, we partnered with the FFA and we are giving it out to the high school so that a goal here is to enable students when they are in high school to get skilled with data and ML, to bring, to bring in, to, to, to not only get skilled, to use it uh, to apply for jobs, but also to use it in their farming practices. So we want the future farmers to start thinking about how they could use data and AI as part of their farming operations. We've also been working closely with academia, with academic partners um, uh, in different, like with Cornell, with University of Illinois, with Purdue. This was work we did with Purdue University around COVID. So this was work done with Professor Jason Lusk. We just published a paper uh, which got published last week on the food and ag health worker risk across the US. So what we did was we took multiple open data sources, um, uh, open data sources, we brought it all together, and then we are predicting What's the likelihood of any commodity getting disrupted in any county across the United States? Like, for example, you, might, you all must have heard of meat packing plants getting closed, some of the milk getting disrupted, or many of these other commodities. Here, we are trying to make those predictions looking at various signals from various data sources. And in this case, for example, we were able to flag that one of the meat packing plants in Yakima was going to close one week before it actually closed. On the left, what you're seeing here is um, an e-commerce dashboard we built for smallholder farmers. We, did, we saw that a lot of smallholder farmers, their operations were disrupted. They would usually sell to the farmer's market, at the farmer's market or to restaurants or to schools or to hotels. And a lot of them were disrupted during COVID. So what we did was we created a dashboard for farmer market makers. These are not the farmers themselves. But people who run farmers market, this was again done with faculty at Purdue University in the agriculture department to connect smallholder farmers to, uh, uh, to, to customers. And the way Microsoft builds all of this, of course, is Microsoft is a very partner led company and we're working with various partners, various uh, companies, uh, like not only data partners, but ISVs and people who can build solutions on top and take these solutions to growers. So this is all great, but I wanted to touch upon some of the open problems. That is, through all the work I described, I think we are still scratching the surface in enabling, truly enabling digital agriculture for farmers worldwide. A lot of our partnerships have been with the, uh, in the developed world with some of the bigger ag tech companies. And here we believe we have mostly, uh, we have made significant progress in driving the adoption of digital agriculture. It's not there, but it will get there. But I think we're still a long way in making 
digital agriculture techniques truly affordable and usable by smallholder farmers worldwide. With Farm Beats, you might have heard about some of our recent announcements, some of our recent partnerships with, say, the government in Indonesia, with the government in India. But those are still mostly government dashboards for policymakers. To take it to the next level so that every farmer can start benefiting, we need to address some key challenges. So as, you, uh, as some of you might know, there are more than 500 million, like more than half a billion smallholder farmers worldwide. And a lot of them are below the poverty line. Most of them are malnourished. The question is, how do you improve their lives with all of these technology advancements that they're making? How do you allow them to farm better? And Bill Gates recently put it well in one of his, uh, one of his articles. He said, he talked about how these farmers, because of the farming techniques they use, they are the least contributors to climate change. However, when we think of climate change, these are the people who will be affected the most because of any changes in climate. They have been doing the same things year over year. And with climate change, they'll see un unexpected changes in weather and they'll be the least prepared unless we do something to help them out. And digital agriculture could be one way in which we can make that happen. And there are many people trying to look at it, especially in the public sector and uh, a lot of nonprofits have been investing a lot of money. So one work that I did, this was work uh, which will be published in the communications of the ACM uh, this year. This was work with the Gates Foundation. I wrote it with Stuart Collis, who's the head of ag, uh, ag work at the Gates Foundation. We looked at various technologies that people have proposed for smallholder farmers and put it on this hype curve, this digital hype curve where if you look at it, any technology has this innovation, it has a, this peak where there's inflated expect, expectations, goes through this trough of disillusionment before it matures and takes off. As you can see, a lot of these technologies are either at the trough of disillusionment or, or before. So the question then is, how do you, and why is it the case? How do you get it to the next level? So when we were looking at this, we found that there were Four key reasons, and we explained that in the paper. We, there are many, but we teased apart the biggest ones, which we need to address. They are around, one is you need to make these things more affordable. That's one of the key bottlenecks. That is, a lot of the technologies that we talk about are just not affordable for a lot of, um, uh, a lot of the smallholder farmers. The second challenge uh, was around uh, connectivity, that is, it's not just, you know, there's 40% of the world doesn't have internet access. And it is not because there is no wireless signal where they are. It's just that it is not affordable for 30% of them. For well, like 90% like of the world lives in an area where there is a wireless signal. It's just not affordable enough for that 30% of them. In addition to that, one of the other problems with connectivity is that there is a gender gap. There are far more women that are not connected to the internet. And you know that in farming, there are a lot of women farmers, more than male farmers. So that's the second challenge. The third challenge was around getting the relevant data. That is a lot of good data to drive your AI is just not available from, from these small scale farmers. Uh, how do you get good data? Like a lot of it is in analog form. A lot of it is not digitized. Even if it is digitized, it's just the quality control is not there. And the fourth key problem was around making all of these technologies, getting them to the farmer, these ICT technologies that people talk about, using voice, using SMS, how do you bridge that gap? How do you take technology to the farmer? So if you have an AI recommendation, how do you take that AI recommendation to the farmer? So we've been at Microsoft, we've been addressing some of these problems. This was a work that was done by a student at Rice University while she was interning at Microsoft Research. One of the questions we asked was around sensing. That is, you know, existing sensors, they cost a few hundred dollars, if not a thousand, if you're measuring soil moisture and soil EC, industrial grade sensors. The question we asked was, well, these farmers won't pay so much money for the sensor that they have to put in the farm. Yet, a lot of, uh, a lot of these growers, they have a smartphone, even if it is an inexpensive smartphone. If it is a smartphone, it has a Wi-Fi chipset in it. If it has a Wi-Fi chipset in it, the key idea was that you could measure the time of flight of Wi-Fi. And the time of flight of Wi-Fi, just based on physics, depends on the permittivity of the material. So in the case of soil, if the soil is moist, it will take longer to traverse the same distance. If you could measure the time of flight, 
you could then use it to start measuring soil moisture and then soil EC. So the vision there is anyone should just be able to bring their phone close to soil and start getting these measurements. Of course, the challenge is it's in 2.4 gigahertz, there's not enough bandwidth because the time we are talking of is in nanoseconds. So then to address this problem, uh, we, our key insight was that most of these Wi-Fi chipsets have multiple antennas. And if they have multiple antennas, you could then measure the relative time of flight between these antennas and use it to measure soil moisture and soil EC. And we compared that with state-of-the-art expensive sensors that you can buy, commercial sensors, and we got very good comparative results. And this paper got an award at ECM Mobicom, which is one of the top conferences in, in, uh, in networking. It also, uh, we showed it to Bill Gates when he visited the farm and the title of the blog in Gates Notes was, can the Wi-Fi in your phone feed the world? So this is something we are bullish on as the vision here, we are still far away from making it commercial, but the vision is that we can truly democratize data-driven agriculture if you can democratize sensing, if you can really make it inexpensive to gather large amounts of data, you can really drive down the cost and enable the adoption of data-driven agriculture. So that's it, I wanted to conclude. This is, a, this is again a table that we have in that paper where uh, with, uh, with, uh, with Stuart at the Gates Foundation, we looked at uh, various types of digital methods. On the left, in the first column, you're seeing the different digital inputs, either coming from sensors, drones, satellites, data platforms, phones, or ICT methods. You'd be collecting digital data from different, different inputs. And then the columns, the other columns here, correspond to different uh, engineering, computer science and electrical engineering disciplines of like hardware and architecture, vision, speech, machine learning, and AI, systems, security, networking, and also human interface. Uh, and you know, these all also correspond to say ECM, uh, like for example, the first one would be SIGARCH. The, the second one would be say the KD, KDD, SIG KDD and others. The third one would be SIGOP, SIGCOM, SIGMOBILE. And within that, we looked at what are some of the key challenges? What are the open research problems that need to be addressed if we really need to drive adoption of digital agriculture for smallholder farmers? We not only wrote that, we also ranked the maturity of that. That is, where is the industry with respect to any of these? Green is where they are closer to getting adopted, like for sensing their ways, their things that people are doing, at least it's not low cost enough, but sensors are, some of them are getting deployed. Maybe not one per farm, but maybe one per village. Similarly, we are, for human interface, we are sending some sorts of alerts, SMS uh, messages or missed calls. They're things that we are doing. In yellow are the ones which require more research, which are much, uh, there's, but still promising. They are, uh, we have some ways in which people are proposing they can be made to work, but there's still a gap. The ones in red are the ones which are way, way behind. We need huge amounts of research in them in order to enable those, those techniques to take off. Some of the key takeaways, if you're looking at here, if you look at the first two rows, everything is in either yellow or green. So we are most likely to see some sensors or remote sensing methods using sat satellites, them taking off. If you look at uh, the second column here with machine learning and AI, it will benefit any of the inputs. It can be used to fill gaps. It can be used to make predictions about the future and it brings value irrespective of whatever method you're using. That said, the one thing which we know that drones and robotics and automation are taking off in the developed world, the third row here, there's a lot more work to be done to get it adopted in the emerging markets for smallholder farmers. So with that, I'll conclude my talk. I talked about FarmBeats, which is a data-driven agriculture platform, which started in research, which is now a product. We've announced partnerships and we are continuing to work on that. But as I said towards the latter part of my talk, we are still scratching the surface with respect to adoption of digital agriculture, data-driven agriculture, and we need a lot more research to truly make that happen. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ranveer, um, for the great talk. It was uh, very interesting. So I guess we can actually go through the questions. Uh, so Edward, would you like to go ahead? Sure, I'm, I'm happy to. Thanks very much, Ranveer, for the very interesting talk and just some really compelling social applications. Thank you, Edward. 
Uh, I, I guess my, my question is um, regarding the, the models that you discussed for, uh, for prediction of things like pH level and moisture levels, and, and they were all, it seemed, uh, data-driven. And I'm wondering whether there were physical models as well from that research community that could have said, well, if, if this was the rain and this was the, the past one, then we have these uh, analytical predictions. And so did you, did, were those helpful and, and did they guide the data-driven models at all or it was just pure data-driven? Right now it's purely data-driven. The simulation part is something we're actively working on. The challenge with the simulations that were desired, there are these models like AppSim is one, and there are others that we work with, some of the companies which are proprietary, they have it, but it doesn't, it's, doesn't take the variations in the farms into account. So, but that's work in progress. One of the things we are looking at is, can you take actual data to make the simulations more accurate, which I think will be super important for them to scale, for them to be more accurate. The one place where we are actually looking at these models is for carbon, uh, soil carbon and uh, and some of the uh, soil nutrients. There, is this, there are a couple of models there. One is the Comet model from USDA coming out of Colorado State. And the other one is DNDC coming out of University of New Hampshire, which is, uh, these are, they sent us a third one which we haven't used, but we are partnering with those, uh, those organizations to use those to predict the amount of soil carbon sequestered in soil. But then the problem is, this is the soil carbon problem which I talked about. The question is, if I have a farm, how much carbon is sequestered in soil for any polygon that you draw. And there are these process-based models, these bi biochemistry-based models, which do a decent job of those predictions if you give all of the inputs. But then that too is, not, is known to be not that accurate because it doesn't capture all the variations. The one thing we're looking at is if you get real samples, real sensor data or sample data, can you customize those simulations to be more accurate? But that is ongoing work. Mm. Okay, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Um, so the second question is from Mariam Khalid. Um, I'm sorry, I will get to you. Um, so um, thanks for the great talk. I have a question about the first part of the talk where you integrated aerial imagery with sensor data, since there are large regions in the farm without sensors for which ground truth is not available. How did you validate the ac accuracy of predicted moisture or pH heat map? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Miriam, what we did there, we, we went through it in multiple stages. The first stage, what we did was, we had three five acre plots where what we did was we collected thousand measurements each in each of those five acre plots. And for, when we did those thousand measurements, these were actually collected from those farms. And then what we did was we asked the question, if you pick only 10 sensors, how accurately did you predict the remaining 990 points in the farm? And we did this for soil temperature, soil moisture and soil pH. Then after that, we've actually taken a lot of open data from some of these long-term research sites that are maintained in the agricultural community. And then we validated it for soil moisture for those pieces of uh, those parts of the farm. You could do more, but this is at a high level what we're doing. Okay, um, thank you. Um, so Ashu, would you like to go ahead? Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, Ranveer, I want to add, uh, Thanks, great talk, uh, fantastic work, wow. Uh, um, uh, I was hoping to, because you talked to quite a few people in the process, so I assume you also understand the human side of it, right? So I was wondering if you could also comment on that. I had like a few questions on that. First one, you know, if you are, let's say, not a rich farmer, I assume you kind of saying, you know, there are many people who are in the uh, lower end of the spectrum, uh, what would be their priorities in spending money? Wouldn't like I want to buy a tractor first or other things than buy sensors? So could you yeah. comment on where in there you think it ranks there? You may not have talked to many, but where would it rank there? Getting that's a great question. That's a great question. That is how do you incentivize farmers? Because you know, most of the farmers don't make a lot of money. They live on the edge. In fact, there was another USDA study which said that 89% of the farmers in the US need a second income to stay afloat. So if you're thinking of that, where do they spend the money, right? And why would they even buy it? So I think regarding adoption, there are a few things that I think need to happen. One is you need to have new business models, like for example, insurance companies, right? Farmers buy crop insurance because they want to know if something goes bad because of any reason, they need to be reimbursed. If they're paying for, for insurance, well, the insurance companies can benefit from getting real data in the, from the farm. 
they can prevent damage, say from a pest or any disease or anything else. They can see things and they can flag to the farmer. So that could be one model. The other thing, though, I think is we need the right policy to enable the adoption of digital agriculture. And this is where I think, like the way a government subsidizes, say, a tractor or an irrigation system, they should be subsidizing digital agriculture. The farmer, the, the government would benefit as well. They can make better policies and the farmers would benefit from it. And I've been talking to governments. I made this case with the USA. I think even in India, they, and this is something I think we need a bigger policy initiative around it if we if we are to see adoption of digital agriculture, especially for the smallholder farmers. The people who need most, who need it most. Right, right. So I have a follow-up question. I think like if I maybe it's maybe it's fair, maybe it's not to kind of say right now we're talking about access, you know, and enabling technologies and then making them available, which I will let's call under this umbrella of um, bringing it to the door. But we kind of know that uh, once you solve the access problem, it will definitely help a lot of them, right? But then there'll be a folks who will fall in a spectrum where often one big challenge is self-efficacy, which is kind of labeled in, uh, in psychology literature that do you feel I can use these technologies and benefit from them, right? This ability to digest data and use it. Um, that may be related to many factors. Maybe it could be education, maybe it could be just understanding, looking at a plot and saying, what do I do with it, right? Um, mm -hmm. Where do you think there people stand there? And like, where do you, is there a thought process already there in, in at least in your head? Like, yeah. What do we do next after solving the access problem? Yeah, no, and I think this is where, um, like part of it is getting the data, but to your point is what do they do with the data? And how do they act on that data? And this is a, this is a hard problem. I, I was actually talking to one of the faculty uh, in one of my meetings before that, what we've not incorporated is the farmer knowledge. That is, before I started this project, I went and volunteered in multiple farms. There was this farm in upstate New York, spent a week planting seeds and so on. They spent some time. What I realized in these volunteering activities was that these farmers, one, they work really hard. It's their morning start at before dawn and it ends after dusk and they're in the farm working. The other thing I realized is that these farmers know a lot about their farm. Every farmer I talked to, one farmer could could just feel the soil and see what's going on. Another farmer would taste the soil. These farmers, they know a lot about what's happening in the farm. They've been farming there for, uh, for like several years, decades, if not generations. Yet, even though they know so much, a lot of decisions they take is based on guesswork. So then our vision when we started Farm Beats was, can you augment a farmer's knowledge with data and data-driven insights, right? So we're not trying to replace the farmer. Now that we've captured the data, we're doing AI, the part that we haven't addressed is how do, you, how do you capture farmer knowledge? Because this is very specific to that farm. Every farmer knows what's happening in their farm. And they'll do, it, they'll do different things in the farm that they have. They'll irrigate at a different time, they plant at a different time. What is that thought process? And how do you incorporate that in the AI models is something we don't know how to do. And that's something I think we need to address. But that's a human side of it that I think will increase adoption, will, will make it easier for farmers to adopt it. In addition to the other incentives, like if an insurance company tells you to do it, you'll do it. But I think if we get to that point, that will that will really ease the barrier where a farmer believes that you know my knowledge is being incorporated into this. But we're not there right now. We don't even know how to do it. Like when you're talking to these farmers who are you're talking different languages, who how do you even templateize what what's there in a farmer's mind? Yeah, there are some good techniques which are used in other areas. You know, I'm happy to uh, send that yeah. information your way if you want. I would yeah. love but, to chat more yeah, about yeah. this. Yeah. Yeah. Great, yeah. Thanks for your thoughts. Yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah. Um, so, Joe, Joe Cavallaro. Joe, would you like to go ahead? Yeah. Uh, Hi, Venmir. I really enjoyed your talk. Very interesting uh, topics. I guess I had a question. I was intrigued by your prediction uh, section. Uh, because you were kind of showing some sort of time series over time for, let's say, uh, some of the factors. Uh, so the question is, how often does the sensing need to be done? And can that sensing also help for things like harvesting? I, I, I didn't hear you talk too much about, you know, when should I pick my strawberries? How, how does that kind of more complicated uh, local vision type of thing end, end into this? And how often should I be updating my, my sampling, my testing? Right, and that Joe, it depends a lot on the type of action, what we're looking to do. Like for example, I talked about uh, 
a farmer wanting to spray chemicals in the farm, at which point they want to know what's going on. If they have, if we have another scenario is about wind, there he needs predictions for an every hour basis. How is it going to look every hour so that once he's taking out his tractor, he knows what the wind conditions are going to be in different parts of the farm. There are other applications like the baby monitor, like the cow monitor example. There's a very interesting scenario here. There's a farm close to Microsoft campus where uh, the one I showed, the smallholder farmer, he was like, there's a, a bear that comes to his farm. It's a black bear, not a grizzly bear. And it always eats up the, the red lettuce, doesn't even touch the green one next to it. And he was like, can you tell me when, a, when you see a bear in my farm? And it's not clear what he would do, as he would come and how he'd stay it away. But his point was, can you tell me right away as soon as you see a bear? If we give that notification a few hours later, the damage would have been done. So depending on what the application is, the sensing frequency varies. And we have to have this kind of mechanism, kind of like software-defined sensing, where for every sensor, you should be able to configure the interval based on the application that you're building on top. One of the applications is harvesting. So we've done this work on, right now for harvesting, what we've done is we've just said, we looked, one of the work we did was on price prediction. So we would do this work was done in India. We're looking at what is the future price of that commodity? And based on that, when should you harvest based on the storage capabilities that you have? The other work we did was for sowing, where we, we predicted this was done for 8,000 farmers in India with Ikrisat, where we were giving them notifications for when to sow the when to sow the seed, when to put it, based on again predicted weather. And they, for these things, you would need sensing data, but you need more about the prediction about what's going to happen in the future, how far you need to predict and at what granularity, that completely depends on the application. Like for wind, this farmer was looking at an hourly interval. For other things where he's looking at how is the soil moisture going to change, that doesn't change much that frequently unless he's irrigating. For other cases, he's looking at a daily prediction that should work or two times a day, just telling what it'll be at noon and at night, and he's fine with it. So depending on what the application is, the sensing frequency can vary. Okay, very good. So there's a big challenge in providing enough sensor data and low cost sensors then in this whole process. That's a huge challenge as we discussed, Joe. That I yeah. think we that we haven't cracked. And I think that's where like both the sensing, how do you do sensing at low cost? How do you do compute at low cost? Like the work you do with FPGAs and, and compute, like how do you do compute on low end devices and how low end can you take it? What can you run in the farm or office uh, for each of these scenarios? Very interesting. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, so I guess we're out of time. Just we have one more question, uh, Ranvi, if you have time. Yeah. Uh, so um, this one is from Shia Gupta. Uh, the question is, how does the prediction accuracy of your AI ML-based model vary with different measurements? <clears throat> For example, soil moisture, which I believe wouldn't change much across the field, but the weather conditions, which could change on a daily basis. I'm um, thinking what would be the most important measurement with respect to a farmer's perspective? Yeah, so uh, this does, so some of these, of course, vary quite a lot. So soil moisture actually varies, but soil temperature doesn't. Uh, soil carbon varies. Sometimes soil nutrient doesn't vary as much. So there are different parameters, some of which vary a lot, others don't. And again, depending on the application, farmers care more about one. We could stack rank them like these days, Soil carbon is something that everyone talks about. And there, there is a lot of variation in the farm and people are looking for, how do you accurately estimate soil carbon? Uh, but yeah, so for our AIML, we are looking at things that vary a lot as well. And that's where the thing that Edward mentioned about, can you use process models to make, and along with sensor measurements, to make even better interpolations? That's something which we're looking at, as opposed to right now, our method uses Bayesian approaches to make these predictions. Uh, basically Gaussian, Gaussian models. And if we can take it to the next stage of, uh, of using, uh, using process-based models to make better predictions, then that would capture the variations even better. So you can imagine a scenario where you're taking process-based simulations, these are biochemistry-based simulations, you have a few sensors and you have radial imagery. How do you combine them to start making better predictions? But that's work in progress. Okay. Um... Thank you so much. Uh, so that, uh, I guess, we, brings us to the end of uh, today's seminar. Uh, again, thank you so much, Ranveer, for the great talk and the discussion. Uh, we hope to have you again uh, soon, uh, sometimes in the future, at Rice Physically. Uh, and 
yeah, so I would like to also thank our audience uh, who joined us today. Thank you. Thank you, Damon, and thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.